Welcome to Timber Creek Church. So glad you're all here. Let's stand together as we worship God. Let's welcome our dive ball and Duncan units. They're going to be worshiping. Away. Come on, let's give them praise. Wait for the end. 
some worship with us today. Great to be in the presence of God here. And before you're seated, why don't you greet somebody around you? Say you're looking good at this 1130. You got a little extra sleep. Then grab a seat. Take a look at the screens. Good morning, Timber Creek. We are so glad to get to worship with you today. If you're new, thank you for choosing to spend a part of your weekend with us. Please fill out the Connect card located in the seat back pocket in front of you or in your chair and drop it in the giving buckets when they're passed or the giving boxes in the lobby. This is a great way for you to take a next step in getting connected or letting us know how we can pray for you. At this time, we're going to continue in our worship through giving. The first Sunday of the month is a great time to start putting God first or re-engaging if it's been a while. Why do we emphasize giving? It's not because we want to get anything from you. We want everything God has for you. At this time, our team is preparing to receive tithes and offerings. You can give at TimberCreekChurch.com through our app, using the giving boxes in the lobbies or the giving buckets as they're passed now. God bless you as you give. Take a look at a few things coming up for you and your family. Hey parents, tonight we have a special workshop just for you. Whether you're a future parent, a parent to small children, or you've been a parent for a really long time, this is an opportunity for you to come and gain some insight and encouragement in today's culture when it comes to parenting. Our guest speaker today that you'll hear from in just a few moments, Pastor Toby Slough, will be leading the workshop. And the goal of this workshop is to help families find hope and freedom in the middle of the rough waters of anxiety and depression and the challenges of today's world. No matter what the circumstances, our hope is that you don't have to do it alone. Scan the QR code in your worship guide to register today. At Silver Creek Church, we want more for the next generation. One of the greatest experiences of the year for kids and students is camp. Camp is happening this year at Lake Tomahawk, and it's going to be an incredible experience. 
It's one of those opportunities where kids and students can go and experience Jesus on a deeper level, make meaningful connections and relationships, and honestly really connect to the heart of God differently than they do on a weekly basis. If your kids and students have not signed up for camp, make sure you do that. Prices go up in just a couple of weeks. You can scan the QR code in your worship guide for more info and to register today. For more information on any of the events mentioned, scan the QR code in the bottom right-hand corner of your worship guide. And once again, thanks for being with us this weekend. Let's try it again. Good morning, everybody. Man, you're looking good today at the Lufkin location. Want to welcome all of our other campuses and the first Sunday after launch Sunday, our Groves campus joining us there in Groves, Texas. Come on, let's welcome each other to church today. Glad to have you this morning. We're going to jump right in, but hey, we need to do a Timber Creek housekeeping moment. And what that means is uh, there, there's just some kind of culture stuff that we need to get right, and this is a family moment. So I'm gonna invite all of our locations, wherever you are, go ahead and stand where you are. Everybody stand right up, and here's the deal, here's the truth. You reproduce what you reiterate. How many times do I have to tell you? Well, a, a few more times, apparently. You reproduce what you reiterate. Uh, you deserve what you tolerate but you keep what you celebrate. Sometimes people think you keep what you criticize. <laughs> That's not a good formula. You keep what you celebrate. And we wanna have a culture of celebration. Uh, you know, the world wants to celebrate to forget stuff or party to forget, you know, the weekend or, or the week. We party to remember what God does. We, we celebrate to remember all the good things. And this last weekend, uh, Super Bowl of Christianity, Easter Resurrection Sunday is an incredible thing to celebrate as God did so many cool things in so many people's lives. And we just wanna celebrate that together. And when we stand up like that, like this is a, a posture of celebrating. And so I'm gonna give you a couple of stats. And when I give you those stats, we're just gonna celebrate at all of our locations, okay? All right, Lufkin, don't be outdone by Mount Enterprise or Grove. Or, or, or Nacogdoches, wink, wink, Nac, wink, wink, Mount Enterprise, wink, wink, Groves, and everybody online in the Glacier Timber Creek and Duncan and Dieball, and everybody else. Here we go. We're going to celebrate some stuff. Let's celebrate Easter, the fact that at Easter weekend on the Dream Teams, there it is, Dream Teams, we had 515 people serving on our Dream Teams. Thank you. 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 You may be wondering, man, I'm not on a dream team. How I get it connected? Starting point every first and third Sunday of the month is your opportunity to kind of dip your toe in the water, learn about who we are, mission, vision, values, and if you want to join a dream team. But here's the deal. We don't need you as much as you need to be serving. You need to be serving. There's just blessings unlocked when you serve people. And through the local church is a great way. So if you are fresh to the church or maybe you've been here but you're not on a team, we would love to talk to you about joining one of our special teams. I had a 13-year-old come to me and said, when can I serve? I said, we don't wait to be great around here. Let's get started. We're going to find a place for you to serve, buddy. We have a place for you. We'd love for you to join us on a dream team. Beyond that, also our attendance, this is crazy. We had all, all across our locations, 6,384 people across our locations. That's just wild. This church was launched March of 1927. So we're almost to our 100th year anniversary. And when the founding pastor launched, it was in a living room and the Lufkin population, the population of the city was 7,000 people. I wonder if he said 96 years ago, it was 97 years ago, you know, someday we're gonna reach this whole city. And they're like, okay, easy pastor, okay, easy. Well, I mean, that's pretty close to 7,000 people, everybody. It's pretty, it's pretty wild what God is doing in the timber country of East Texas and South Texas there at Groves. And every person represents a story, every story 
you as a person has a soul. Every soul matters to God. Hey, we want to celebrate what happened with our survey. Every Christmas, every Easter, we do a one-question survey. It's part of our tradition here. It helps people do business with God. And on A, B, C, or D, people would mark A, if they were following Jesus already, B, if they needed to ask Jesus to be the center of their life, the Lord and Savior of their life. Still considering would be C, kicking the tires. Like, we want people to, like, you know, accept Christ so fast. And they got to consider some things. We'll buy a car slower than we, like, give our life to Christ. And people need to go on a journey and then some people say no thanks because they were like dragged here by their fingernails on their fingernails through the parking lot by a, by a friend or a relative or a grandma and 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 we we understand that at Easter when it comes to those that said no thanks we had uh, 11 people say no thanks you know what that says to me it says to me you're inviting people thank you keep inviting people we're thankful for those that have 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 that experience to say no thanks because we want to pray over them in just a moment along with everybody else those that are still considering we have 50 people say i need to start taking a journey maybe you're back this sunday so glad that you're here let's take this journey together taking next steps to see what god wants to do in your life but we really want to celebrate not just the thousands that, that marked A of following Jesus. I invite you to take another level of surrender and obedience to God. Keep on obe obeying. Keep on surrendering. Another next level of surrender. But those that cross the line of salvation saying, hey, I want Jesus to be to save me. Uh, their name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It, we're going to celebrate. You ready to celebrate big? You ready to celebrate how many people said, I need to dedicate my life or rededicate my life to Jesus on Easter weekend? Come on. Let's go. All locations. Let's celebrate 596 people. Wow. Wow. And if you're one of those, we're so proud. You know what? Next step is to get water baptized, is to follow Jesus the way that he followed his father and get water baptized. It's a public confession uh, of your faith. And uh, in the third Sunday of every month, we, we see people water baptized. We'd love to, to have you scan the QR code and, and sign up for water baptism. Let's say a prayer over these. Father, thank you for everybody following. Thank you for everybody that showed up, everybody that served, everybody that uh, in their heart bowed a knee to you. Lord, I pray for those that said no thanks. Like if you are who you say you are, meet them where they are. Lord, for those still considering just like Nicodemus, just like even the disciples had to figure this out. They didn't quite understand it. They had to follow and understand and like consider these things. I pray that those that are considering would take that journey. Lord, thank you for those. And not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, will make it into the kingdom of heaven because we can say some things that not mean it in our heart. But Lord, for those that are meaning that in their heart and figuring that out, Lord, I pray, thank you for meeting them right where they are on the road they're on. You don't make us get on the straight and narrow to meet us. You meet us on the road we're on. And I pray blessings over every single person that made a commitment and decision on Easter weekend. May it start there in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Well, as you stay standing, today we start a new series, Reply All Parenting Edition. Did you know parenting is one long conversation? It is one, it's not one conversation at three and five and seven and 13. It is one long conversation. We start a series of one long conversation, not, not about how to parent, but we start with how do you think about stuff? How do you think about parenting? And how do you even think about certain things? And I knew that to start this series, I wanted my friend uh, from the DFW Metroplex to come and, and get us started today. My friend Toby uh, planted, him and his wife Micah planted a church uh, 20 some years ago, Cross Timbers Church. It has exploded in growth, uh, several locations, many, many thousands of, of people across the Metroplex. And uh, Toby is a friend of mine. And Toby's got an incredible story. Recently, they transitioned the church to new leadership so they could journey across almost every single state already in the last 14 months, even internationally, helping parents get equipped, Christian parents get equipped on talking with their kids, giving them resources on mental health. It's, a pan it's, an, it's an epidemic, it's an issue, it's the silent pandemic that we've dealt with and really became exposed in 2020. Today, we're gonna talk more deeply about it. Friends, will you help me the same way that I wanna welcome my friends? Will you welcome my friend, Toby Slough, as he comes to speak? Love you, man. Love you, buddy. Thank you. Be seated. Before I teach, I always do two things. I look at one truth about me 
that I'll tell you about in a moment how you can do this too, but the other is I look at the picture of my five grandkids and remember they love me no matter what you think, and that always helps me as I get ready to teach. I grew up in South Texas, not far from here. I grew up in a little town called Angleton. In fact, my best friend, his father was a fisherman, so I spent a lot of time here in East Texas uh, fishing in places where almost all of our campuses are represented. And uh, I am honored to be here and honored to talk to you about this issue. You know, one of the things about growing up in South Texas, my parents were both public educators, so our summers were filled with family trips uh, that didn't cost a lot of money. Did I mention they were public educators? And uh, one of the things we did is my Aunt Blanche had a, everybody look at me, beach house. Okay, don't think HGTV, think Hut TV, but it was free. We would go and stay, and so much of my life is intertwined in things my father taught me at the beach. I was seven. We had been at Aunt Blanche's beach house. Came home to have dinner uh, back in Angleton. Been there two or three days. The phone rang. Now, back then, we had a phone that plugged into the wall. I know some of you next generation people, that's as crazy as getting up and answering your own, I mean, changing your own TV station. But we did that stuff back then. Uh, when nobody called, we didn't answer. It was, how was that? It was awesome. Uh, the phone rang, mom answered it and immediately screamed no and started crying. My father came over. My father was a coach, he's a public educator. He doesn't cry much. He got emotional. I went over and said, what happened? They told me that a, a family friend had drowned that day at Surfside Beach where we had been. But we had seven people in a circle that we knew of community or church or friend of a friend in our little area that drowned at that beach. And I remember saying, Dad, what was he doing? He was surf fishing. You guys ever seen anybody surf fish? They're in water to their knees. And I said, how do you drown in water to your knees? And Dad taught me about the undertow. I'll never forget it. An unseen force that is consistently pulling you in a direction that you would never want to go. And if you do not learn how to fight it, it will take you under. Then my dad, being my dad, just like this, Toby, look at me. This is why we're always careful at the beach. Now go to bed. I went to bed. Any of you guys overthinkers? Anybody overthinker? Any of our campuses? Two hands if you're charismatic and you overthink a lot. I've always been an overthinker, and I had a thought as I laid in the bed. I wonder what it feels like to drown. Does it hurt? Or do you just go to sleep? When they find my body, I wonder who would come to the funeral. I started getting mad at people that weren't coming to my imaginary funeral. <laughs> now, there was a poster in my lunchroom of my elementary school that said, you are what you eat. Yo, anybody remember this poster from my generation? I, I think I was a chicken McNugget at that point in my life. It's not true. You aren't what you eat. You are what you think. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So what does that mean? That means if you consider a negative possibility long enough, it does become a reality in your heart. I mean, some of you came today just because you need to hear this. Get off TikTok. Seriously. Turn the news off. Because the longer you consider possibilities in your heart, they become, a. it goes from that could happen, well, actually it goes from that's weird to that could happen to, oh my gosh, that's going to happen. And I went to sleep that night, tears running down my face, seven, praying this prayer, please God, don't let me drown. Having no idea that for the next 53 years of my life, that would be the prayer I would pray the most. 
I'm not drowning in physical water. I haven't been in ocean water past my ankles since that day. True story. People laugh and people go, I can fix you. Hey, how about you go to Home Depot, get you some lumber, build a bridge and get over it. I ain't doing it. I'm just not. Right? Very irrational, very real to me. No, uh, some of you know what I'm talking about. Two out of every three of you in this room know what I'm talking about. My name is Toby. I'm 60 years old. Been married to this sweet lady. Next month will be 39 years we've been married. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Baby, that's all for you. That's all for you. you stars in your crown. Uh, I, I believe everything in the Bible is true, even the stuff I don't like or understand. Come on, lamentations. I mean, y'all know what I'm talking about there? Wager through, way through. I, but I think it's all true. I've given my life to teaching it. Before my feet hit the ground this morning at the Marriott Hotel, where is that? Where, I don't know, wherever I'm staying, I ask God to fill me with His Holy Spirit today. I, ask, I do not let my feet hit the ground any day without asking Him. Why? Because I am aware of my inadequacy and insufficiency. And I also know that I leak on a regular basis. And I really love Jesus, man. Not the idea of him. Not something to get me through. Or to like come see him on Sunday. I, I saw him yesterday and I saw him the day before. I mean, I, I, I love him. And... 30 years ago, I was diagnosed with an anxiety and panic disorder. And God hasn't healed me of it. And church people don't know what to do with me because I don't fit in the box of just trust God, just pray harder, just believe more. So I, I don't feel like I'm... Um, the sharpest knife in the drawer most of the time. I, I, I don't feel like I have a million gifts, but I need you to look at me and hear me say, I know what I'm talking about today because I've lived it for almost 30 years. Like I have been in a graduate degree at a university nobody ever wants to go to. And I have discovered some things about what Jesus really offers us. It's not what most of you have been told. And what our battle really is. Like, I believe that by his stripes we're healed. Come on, somebody. But here's the thing. I don't believe that God, I think in heaven he's, it's going to be 100% healing. But not on earth. Only everybody gets healed every time. Why? I have no idea. I am comfortable with a God who operates in a way that I don't completely understand. I know some of you aren't. Trust me, you live enough life and you'll get there. You'll want a God that's bigger than you. Not that it won't make you mad, but you won't lose your faith. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I don't go a day without asking him to heal me. I just don't need him to heal me for me to believe he's real and that he loves me. Because I understand relationally that putting conditions on a relationship with one who loves me unconditionally is called dysfunction. Right? Right? And I found that what Jesus offers is better than 100% healing. He offers freedom. Freedom is not the absence of something. Freedom is the presence of someone in the middle of something. Some of you need to hear this. That freedom is not that you are never depressed. Freedom is that there is a power and a person named Jesus who is helping you overcome in your moments of depression. You with me? And Jesus bats a thousand with us on this side of heaven when it comes to freedom. 
And freedom is better because I am free. So what can the devil do to me? I mean, what's he, what can he do? He's taking his best shot and I'm still pitching. I'm still going, I'm still believing. And by the way, I'm happy. Some of you think you could never be happy until you're never whatever your problem is taken away. That's not true. You can find real joy in life in spite of your challenges because Jesus came so that you might have power in the middle of your challenges. I've also learned the battle isn't what I always thought the battle was. People say, what did you have to have to be anxious about? I don't have anything. I have a disorder. I think I make things up. Okay, you know what I'm saying? Like some of you have situational anxiety. I get that. I have this genetic predisposition that is in my, my life, my child's life, one of my children's life, my grand some of my grandchildren's life has been passed down. And it's, it's, it's the way God wired us. We, we have artistic dominant brain. And studies show that those with an artistic dominant brain are more, are, they're more prone to anxiety and depression. I don't want to give up the gift of what God has given me to create because of this battle. But the battle really isn't about anxiety and depression. It's about how vulnerable I come to my feelings in the middle of my battle, right? Like how many of you have ever struggled and you feel like your prayers don't get past the ceiling? Anybody besides me ever go, God, my prayers don't get, none of y'all, y'all are all holy over here. <laughs> Guys in Nacogdoche, it's not me, man. He can't see me, it ain't me. Um, I feel that way all the time, but can I tell you something? Your prayers don't have to get past the ceiling because God's not past the ceiling. The kingdom of God is within your reach. It's near. That's what Jesus came to proclaim. He's not out there. He is within your reach. In fact, anybody who told you if, if, God, uh, if God seems distant, guess who moved? That's a lie. If you move, he moves with you. That's the good news of the gospel of Jesus, right? He doesn't treat you as your sins deserve. He's not punishing you. You are unpunishable in Jesus. Yeah, but it doesn't feel like it. The battle that you face is to let what you know control what you feel instead of letting what you feel control what you know. That's the battle. Now, this church, as strong as it is, as much ground as you're taking, you are not a statistical anomaly because there isn't one out there. Two out of every three of you at some level deal with anxiety, depression, are generally feeling overwhelmed by life. It's just, that's the world we live in. This is the Chicago fire of our generation that's happening. Right? And, and so those of you who don't, can I give you a word? Like, I'm... I'm glad that the way God wired you and knit you together in your life experience, this has never been a battle for you. Like, I really am. 10 years ago, I was mad at you, but I'm not anymore. I mean, I really am. I see it as a gift. I think you want to help people. True? Can I tell you that, generally speaking, overall, you're not? You want to. Uh but it's because I don't think you understand the battle we're facing. Like telling us not to think about something doesn't help us. Just quit thinking about it. Oh, great, thanks, I'll cancel my counselor. It doesn't work that way, right? So, so I'm gonna help you understand what our battle really is and how you can help. And then for the rest of you, I'm gonna show you what your battle is and where you begin to find the answers. Does that sound fair with everyone? I'm gonna to talk to you about the three greatest battles at some level all of us fight, especially in the area of mental wellness. The, the first one is this, and I hear this all the time. Pastor Jeremy mentioned a moment ago, we, we, we've been in half the states in the union over the past 14 months. I'm, I'm, I'm doing market research, if you will, in every kind of place you can go. And I'm learning that everyone is battling the same thing. And the, 
the thing I hear from people is, well, man, God just doesn't work that way in my life. Right? That, that there's something wrong with God. The Bible doesn't work for me. And I'm like, well, which part of the Bible doesn't work for you? And what most people say is, this is, you guys have heard the word deconstruction, people who are deconstructing their faith. Which, by the way, everybody deconstructs their faith. It's people who stop deconstructing before they start reconstructing. That's how you make faith your own. Like deconstructing isn't a bad thing unless you quit reconstructing. And most of them quit, and you know why they quit? Well, if God was real, then why did fill in the blank happen? Oh, you're assuming that God puts you on this planet to make you healthy, wealthy, and wise and to fix all your problems. Show me that in the Bible, somebody. Let's go ask Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who decided to do the right thing. We ain't bowing no matter what you do to us. And he says, okay, I'm condemning you to death by fire. The next sentence of Daniel 1 says the next morning. And my question is, what was it like from the moment the sentence was handed down until the next morning? They're, we know they're in captivity. We know they're building the world's largest pizza oven right outside wherever they're, cap, they're in captivity. They can smell the smoke. They see the crowd gathering. Do you really think they were going, boys, this is going to be awesome. We're going to be in the Bible someday. <laughs> they're asking, begging God to do something. And God did something. He showed up in the form of Jesus, the fourth in the fire. He didn't show up around the fire. He showed up in the fire. Huh. Daniel in the next chapter is more afraid of not praying than he is of a hungry lion. The end of that chapter, a pagan king is issuing not a suggestion, an edict to a pagan nation that they're gonna worship Jehovah God above all gods. And it happened because Daniel went in the den, not around the den. I could go on. We know Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. My soul was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Don't let anyone tell you that your depression and anxiety is because of a lack of faith, unless Jesus had a lack of faith, which we know he did not. You're anxious because there are things in your life that are causing you to be anxious. You're depressed because something in your life is depressing. Jesus begs God not to make him go. We all as Christians skip to not my will, but your will be done because it makes us feel better. But he wasn't every way man. You do understand this, right? He's experiencing what we're experiencing. He is hanging on a cross saying, my God, my God, why did you, have you forsaken me? I was taught that it was because the sins of the world were on him and God couldn't look at his sin. That's not in the Bible. That's just a hymn we sing. I think he was experiencing what I experienced, that God, that God must have left me because it hurt so bad. And we're sitting here today because of the cross, not in spite of the cross. What if I told you that your struggle is not a symbol of the, of the absence of God, but a mark of the beginning of God's supernatural work in your life? Like, I am a miracle. It just didn't come in the package I wanted. There's nothing wrong with God. And by the way, number two, Contrary to what some of you have been told, there's nothing wrong with you. Like your struggle is not an indicator of something defective in your faith. It's just not. Show me that in the Bible. Like we want heaven here. But the fact of the matter is we live under an open heaven, but good things happen to bad people. We're the disciples walking with Jesus down the road, and there was this 
tragedy where this tower fell over and all these people got hurt. And the people go, who sinned, them or their parents, that this tower fell over? You remember this? Remember what Jesus' answer was? Sometimes towers just fall down. That's the fallen world we live in, right? And yet, we've been conditioned to believe there must be something wrong with us if we're battling for our mental health. How many of you have a life verse? Raise your hand if you have a life verse. Come on, just encourage me, lie, even if you don't. Just go, yeah, I got one, Pastor, yeah, I got one. Life verse is the verse that, I call it your true north. It is the verse that God gives you uh, that when life gets out of whack, that's the verse you go to. And I've I've asked people all over this country, what's your life verse? And people have called out in smaller environments, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I am more than a conqueror. And number three, nothing will separate me from the love of Christ. Which are all great life verses. The only problem is you don't get to pick your life first. Your life first picks you. But God wires you in a unique way. You have unique challenges. You have unique strengths and weaknesses. And God's word, which, look at me, everybody, is living and active, not words on a page. Living and active pierces your soul and sustains you in the most difficult of moments. Y'all want to know what mine is? Say yes, and you'll get out earlier. <laughs> Y'all came to the danger service. This is the last one. I, we ain't no parking lot turn around. Y'all don't get enthusiastic. I'll just, I'm going, I'm Eutychus. We're going on and on until somebody falls out the window. Um, mine comes from 2 Corinthians 12. Paul is my hero. He, he, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He is the reason that we get to be believers. He's the one who called out this division and said, hey, God said that that non-Jews get to come to the party. Right? Planted churches everywhere. And he says this, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. So Paul has been given this gift. He's able to see into the third heaven. If you don't understand what that is, just ask Pastor Jeremy. He'll explain it to you in detail. But he called it a thorn in the flesh. Nobody knows what it is. I could line up theological books high, everyone giving a compelling reason for it was he couldn't see well, he couldn't hear well, he had uh, blood disease, he had this. Nobody knows. I think God did it on purpose so you could see you in the story. When he says it tormented him, I think it was mental health because sometimes, honestly, I feel tormented. Am I the only one? That black wave, I mean, he says three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Now, that doesn't mean a literal three times. Anytime in the Bible, they were, these, this culture, you <clears throat> They'll use multiples to let you know he didn't just do it one time. I plead with the Lord to take it away from me. The greatest missionary this side of the cross who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament had one big prayer he prayed over and over again. Take away this one in the flesh, it's tormenting me. But he said to me, no. My grace is sufficient. My power is made perfect in weakness. That's my life verse. Anybody want to put that on a coffee cup or a t-shirt? But he said to me, no. My power in your life, Paul, is going to be made perfect in your low light reel, not your highlight reel. Huh. Y'all know that ESPN uh, during football season they got the Saturday morning show and the big hit is you had one job and it's the guy messing up. God says, I'm using you had one job, not when you got it right. So he says, I'm, therefore I will boast all the more gladly. Everybody say boast. Boast. Not hide. Boast about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. 
My goal is to walk out the door and people to go, God must be awesome because that dude's whacked out. Is it possible that not only is your struggle the signal of a miracle of God at work in your life, there's nothing wrong with God, but there's nothing wrong with you. That God is using all things for your good. I'm gonna tell you this, because I always, when I do multiple services, I like to give free stuff to the people who've been in all three. I'm scared of who I would have been if I wouldn't battle this for 30 years. I don't think I'd have empathy for any of you. Not because I don't care, but I'm a driven type A, let's go take the mountain guy. Before this is over, I will cry. And I'm not crying because it's so sad for me. Like I, in the spirit, I see things over your head in this room. I feel your pain, that's why I cry. This would have never happened if God wouldn't have allowed this in my life. So I'm not gonna go, God, thanks for it, but I can say, hey, God, thanks for the way you have shaped me with this. You know why Paul had this, uh, you, you know why Romans says that we know in all things God works for the good of those who love him? You know why he had to say all things? All things aren't good. This isn't good. Your battle with depression, I'm not saying your battle is good, I'm saying God's gonna do something good that you can say to him, I'll never thank you that I got it, but I'll thank you for how you used it. I just want you to consider that possibility because that's my life, right? But you have to come to the place where you believe that your struggle is not your identity. The world is lying to you subtly. The world is telling you what makes you matter and who you are. I sign books at events like this. I've done it the last couple of services here. Not because, it, I kind of feel weird about signing books. Really, I, It's not because I want to sign books. I just want to talk to you. And I have men, every time I do this, walk up to me and tell me that their dad told them they never amount to anything. And they fought it their entire life. And I tell them all the same thing. I'm sorry your dad said that. Your dad was wrong. Your dad doesn't get to define you. The only one that defines you is the one who created you, period. So you better figure out who God says that you are. Because if you don't figure it out before you get in the mess, you're gonna be like the guy who's shopping at the grocery store when he's hungry. You're not gonna win that battle. Y'all with me? Like your kids are being told every day who they are and what makes it matter. You get this? Oh, not, I had one lady tell me in one place, oh, my six-year-old, she knows who, nobody's telling her who she is. Oh, yes, they are. <laughs> like our job as parents and grandparents is to get into DNA of their being. Here's who God says that you are. I, I want you to come tonight to this parenting workshop. It is where I see God do the greatest work in local churches and helping families, right? I'm telling you, I'll make you a guarantee. You come, I'll make you this guarantee. I will pay you back whatever you pay out of my own pocket in 30 days if you do what I ask you to do, which will take five minutes a day, five days a week. Is that fair? Everybody can do five minutes a day, five days a week. If you'll do this with your kids, I promise you in 30 days, you will have made progress with your kid and their mental health. I promise. Nobody's, nobody's asked for a refund yet. And we'll begin with identity. Why? Because 20 years ago when I was struggling, I called a pastor in another state and said, hey man, I'm struggling. I can't get out of this loop. I need some help. The only thing my wife could tell me is quit thinking about it. That wasn't very helpful. God bless her. And he said, go to Google and Google the 40 I am's. I didn't even ever heard of the 40 I am's. But the 40 items are 40 statements from the Bible about who God says that you are. He said, write them on index cards and say them out loud. 
See, I didn't understand. That out loud seemed weird to me. I didn't understand that my faith was verbal. But look at me, everybody. Y'all do know Jesus went on the storm-tossed sea did not do this. He didn't do the genie thing. What did he do? He spoke it, right? Why? Because in the new kingdom that he ushered in, your words have potential to create reality. Be very careful what you're saying about yourself and your future. Be very careful about never and always statements. Be very careful about it. When you say something that feels like it's not true, even though it's true, that's not hypocrisy, it's called faith. So I went to CVS, I got me some cards, I wrote them all down. I went and sat at my picnic table in my backyard, had a rear entry garage, Mike is coming around, I'm sitting there screaming these things, throwing them down on the table. She's looking at me like, you've lost your mind. I go, yes, I have. People ask me, which ones were you saying? I was saying the ones that were the hardest for me to believe. And for 20 years, in multiple countries, in multiple travels, I have never one day gone anywhere without those cards that I've had for 20 years. Except for maybe this one. They're covered in dirt and snot and tears and anger and disappointment and hope. And you will pry them out of my cold, dead hands. These are my greatest earthly possession. I will never graduate from needing them. It will never be beneath me the practice of looking into a mirror and saying, I am a child of the king. Look at me, everybody. I am not anxiety. I am overcoming daily in the power of Jesus Christ. That's who I am. And I need to say it the most when I don't feel it. Right? I want to give you something free today. I want to give you the 40 I am. We started, we started making PDFs of them, printing them out, and having, we, we've getting out over 100,000 of them. I got tired of carrying them around and running out, so we just made a digital copy of them. And here's the QR code. You can ask somebody younger than you if you don't know how that works. And... Uh, Micah has my phone over there. I thought I had it, but I gave it to her. But if you look at it, the front of mine says the same thing it says every Sunday. You have more strength than you think you have. And I don't leave a hotel without looking in the mirror and saying, you have more strength than you think you have because Christ's power is in me. Y'all hearing me? Hey, look at me, everybody. You don't need a sermon. You need a strategy. You need something to do every day. Where am I get it? You're going to get it for me because I've done it for 30 years. My kids do it. My grandkids do it. But if you keep doing what everybody else does, don't be surprised that you get what everybody else gets. Nothing wrong with you. You are a child of the king. And he's using this to move you forward. Number three, finally, quickly. I am going to go quick. Y'all been kind of nice to me. Um, you don't laugh at my jokes very much, but <laughs> number three, I've always thought that positive progress is God's plan for my life. Like I'm linear. Anybody else linear? Are you like A to B? I, I'm linear, right? Uh, so when God called me to ministry, you know, you all have a calling, right? You get this. Please don't think you have to work at a church. I need butchers, bakers, candlestick makers, attorneys, oil field workers, teachers, coaches. I need, in this community, needs people full of God's spirit out there in those areas doing ministry. This town needs thermostats, not thermometers. We set the temperature. We don't reflect the temperature. Why? Because Christ in us is the hope of glory. It's not because we did anything. It's because he did everything. Y'all with me? I could go on this for a while. <clears throat> but when you get a calling, you build a plan. That's what I did. God called me to local church ministry and I built a plan. Can, can I tell you that my plan was always up and to the right? In fact, when, it was, when I take a step back, it must mean that I had done something wrong and God was fixing me, Right? And the problem is when your plan doesn't go up and to the right, 
and you take a couple steps back, you forget, thank you so much, you forget that it was your, God's calling, but it was your plan. You fill the whole thing out. Y'all with me? Hey, can I, man, I just feel like the, somebody right over here, I don't, don't want to leave everybody out, but I just feel like, man, somebody, I'm, God keeps pulling me over here. Because I want you to hear me say that I sat up in bed almost 30 years ago one night with my hands sweating and breathing hard and my heart feeling like it's going to beat out on my chest. And you guys all know we had a panic attack. 30 years ago, I'd never heard of a panic attack. I never heard the word depression. I thought I was having what my granny called a nervous breakdown. That's the only thing I knew, right? It was either you were doing good or you were completely whacked. And so I got out of bed because I'm a guy and said, I'll walk it off. I started walking the hall of my house. She's dead asleep because she had full rim before her head compresses in the pillow. Can't stand it. <clears throat> and uh, I'd walk a couple hours. I'd feel like I was getting better. And I would lay down in our living room on the floor. I remember it was a sunken living room one step and I'd lay down. We had an eight track player. I'll tell you later what that is. And it had one, one eight track in it. It was Mercy Came a Run In by Phillips, Craig, and Dean. I would play it and beg God to do something and hear nothing. And then I'd feel this stuff coming back up in me. So I'd walk. The only thing I knew is I had to be back in bed at by 530. So she wouldn't know. Well, why didn't you tell her? Do you remember me saying I'm an overthinker? When I walked, I thought two things. Number one, somewhere along, this breaks my heart. I'm still sad for this guy. Me, like it was like I must not have asked God to forgive me for everything. Something I missed, so he's, he's getting me back. So I just started thinking of everything I'd ever done. I mean, I'm asking him to forgive me for stuff when I was six, that kind of thing. And the other thing was I started thinking about what it would be like for my wife to leave me and take my kids and for me to lose my job and what would I do? So I'm not telling anybody. I did it for 17 days. People would come up to me and go, Pastor, you're looking, you're looking thin. Are you, are you working out? I couldn't tell them the truth. No, I'm throwing up. 21 pounds in 17 days. Terrible. So what does a guy do who is scared to death of people finding out the truth about him who was created to be fully loved and is terrified of being fully known. So I made a plan. Let me get my truck. Let me go on I-35. I'm going to get as fast as I can get going. I'm going to run into a bridge above me and kill myself. And nobody will know I did it on purpose. And at the last moment, I got close to that bridge. The Lord gave me a picture of my wife telling my seven-year-old daughter, that I was never coming home and I swerved and felt like a coward. But it scared me. It scared me. And I went home and did the thing I didn't want to do the most, which is always the first step toward freedom. I told them when I loved the most the truth about where I was and I started this journey toward healing. And on my good days, my plan, I would tell her, I'm gonna travel the world, write a book, and show everybody how you get healed from this kind of issue. And on my bad days, I told her I was gonna go sell used cars to quit my job because the church des deserves somebody stronger than me. And as our church got ready for its 20th birthday, 20 years later, uh, my, inner, my executive team that were my dearest friends had said, you need to write a book. And I said, I'm not writing a book. Who, who wants to write a book about trying to run into a bridge and how much church people hurt them through the years? I don't want to do that. But some of you young guys need to hear me when I say, if you look at her, if you get somebody like that, 
who loves Jesus and looks like that, and she says, well, I think you ought to write a book, then you probably ought to do what she says, which is what I did. So I wrote a book called Not Yet, which is just the big lessons I learned in 20 years of this battle. The book wasn't, the challenging part of the book was the last chapter where uh, the lady who was helping me said the last chapter has to be the best because you're leaving somebody with something. I didn't know what to write because it had to be good. I was froze. So I have a really cool assistant. Her name is Google. And uh, I kept thinking about a salmon fish, you know, swimming upstream. So I Googled what's something else like a salmon fish. And I learned about a goby fish. It's found only off the, isle, the big island of Hawaii. It's born in the salt water, but when the tide is just right, it starts swimming up the mountain streams until it gets to the waterfalls. As it's swimming, as it gets toward the waterfalls, God grows its bottom jaw out. It's crazy. I mean, go look it up. If you wanna know how God's kingdom works, look at the kingdom you can see that he created. Nature will show you. And the reason he grows it out is because it literally jumps from rock to rock with its mouth to get to the top and spends the rest of its life in the top of those mountain streams. True, it's true. And I cried and said, that's me. The very thing I had been running from was the very thing God was using to shape me into the person he wanted me to be. So we get ready to do the series, we release, to release the book. We're in the last week of the series. I, I'm not really sure what to do, so I, I, I gotta tell something about the goby fish. I went to YouTube, that I mentioned it was a pretty good assistant, and said, how do you draw a fish? And I sat at the bar in my kitchen, not a bar, that's another message. I sat at a, my, the bar in my kitchen with six legal pads, seven pencils, and a six minute video until I taught myself how to draw a fish. I called my creative team and I said, I need five big, like these boards up on the stage, I'm gonna tell the story of this little fish. What are you gonna call it? Well, I'm gonna call it Toby the Goby because it rhymes so that sounds like Jesus to me. They said, you can't draw a fish. I sent them this picture and said, you can learn anything on YouTube. Look, I learned. I told the story and look, look at me, everybody. Five days later, COVID hit. And my daughter-in-law, who is a accomplished graphic artist whose dream since she was a little girl was to animate a kid's book I called her and said, we have some time, let's do it. And this book was born, Toby the Gobi. And it exploded all over the country. It teaches three things. Number one, you can do hard things because God is with you. You're not a victim. It is hard, but you can do it. Number two, you have to keep your eyes on the sun. They don't know this, kids don't know it, but I told y'all already, right? If you consider a negative possibility long enough, right? It becomes a reality. So let's consider the truth about what God says. Keep your eyes on the sun. Number three, help others along the way. And the book exploded. Hit number one on Amazon's bestseller list for children's nonfiction books for a season. Uh, we translated it into Spanish and released it in South America. We are translating it into Hindi and we'll take it into India. I've been asked to translate it into seven dialects of Farsi and take it into the Middle East, the war-torn, like. <laughs> thank you, but, but look at me, guys. You understand what I'm telling you? Is, this was not my plan. My plan was to get healed. This wasn't my plan. My plan was not to fly 400,000 miles airline in the last 15 months. That wasn't my plan. To stand in front of thousands and you know how hard it is to stand up every week and talk about taking your one to run the bridge, man? Like, this wasn't my plan. And look at me, I want to tell you something. This is the best season of my life. The most fulfilling. I know I'm helping people. but I didn't get it until I got this picture of this little boy who is seven years old. You see him? You see those little drawings up on the wall? We made a kid's version of the 40 I Am's. Some bird had hit his window 
And he convinced that somebody's trying to get him. And for like a week, he hadn't gone, it was a battle getting to bed. And some of you that haven't had kids that age yet don't know, that's a huge deal. So his mama let him pick five of those four AMs, and he said, look, I put them on my wall so that I would remember that Jesus was with me and I'd have a good night and be able to sleep and have a good day. That is my oldest grandson, Gideon. And I'm laying there for the last 53 years going, hey God, why won't you fix me? And I spent all this money on counselors because my goal was to get fixed. And God said, oh no, I have a legacy for you. There's another little boy. There's another little boy who feels like he's drowning. And fidget spinners and weighted blankets aren't going to be enough. He needs you to be the first place, not the last place he goes. Like that right there, he's my legacy. And I'd do it a hundred years more. And some of you know how dark it is in those moments, don't you? To help that kid. You have a legacy, man. Every one of you, you go, I don't know who it is. I didn't know who it was either 53 years ago. But God's at work. He's a good dad. He has a good plan for your life. The secret to this deal, this is really deep and probing. Keep swimming. You keep walking. You don't stop believing. It's hard. It's supposed to be hard. But it is hard. I get it. You go, nobody gets it. Look at me. I get it. Somebody gets it. And God's at work. And one day, you'll have that kind of moment too. It's hard for me to describe how, how much, how honored I feel in this place and played my little part in helping you find the freedom that you're looking for. I'm going to tell you something. We are going to change generations together. I believe it beyond a shadow of a doubt. Can I pray for you? All right? Like it, I'm going to just tell you, this morning was like rough for me. Why? I'm talking about early this morning. I don't know. I just woke up and there was some anxiety. Not about this, just that's who I am. And uh, frustrated me a little bit. So I'm pray for me. I'll pray for you. Is that good? So Father, just, just raise your hand if you need me to pray for you because it's been tough. If you guys that have your hand up would just look around like the big lie is that you're the only one. Look how many people. Look. So Father, you see our hands, but you know our hearts. And help us not grow weary in doing good because we will reap a harvest of blessing. And I thank you for the hope that doesn't disappoint, not hope for something, hope in someone named Jesus. So come Jesus, do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Equip us to be everything you've called us to be. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Toby. Thank you so much. As our teams come down front uh, this morning, you know, when, a, when an airplane or a jet uh, starts going down or gets in trouble, they always instruct us to put the mask on us first. And the reason why is so we can help the person next to us. We can't help the person next to us if we are running out of oxygen ourselves. And so um, that's kind of what tonight is about. That's what this series is about, is us helping, uh, God helping us put the mask on so that we can help ourselves and we can help the ones to the left and to the right of us. And so on your worship guide there, if you haven't registered, don't miss this amazing opportunity. And this is aunts, uncles, grandparents, parents, moms, dad, 
Um, this is an amazing resource and opportunity uh, for next steps uh, in, in, in mental health of, of, of walking through it yourself or helping someone walk through it. So if you haven't registered, there is a small fee to register. Um, if, if that small fee is what's keeping you from being able to attend, uh, you can see our team out in the lobby. We have some scholarships. We can help you get here. We do not want the small fee to be the thing that keeps you from uh, being part of it tonight. And so um, if you will go ahead and stand uh, this morning, but stay with me, please. If, if today during this message, the, 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 the thing that maybe has resonated on you is you made that decision uh, to accept Jesus for the first time or for a fresh time, over here our following Jesus team is ready to meet with you and pray with you and answer any questions you may have. If today's your first day at Timber Creek uh, and you're just kind of figuring out who we are and you have any questions that you might want to uh, have answered over here, our new to here team is ready to connect with you and answer any questions you may have. If you want prayer this morning, our prayer team is down front ready to pray with you. Again, looking forward to seeing everybody come back tonight and be part of this. We love you guys. Thank you so much for being with us today, and you guys have a great Sunday.